about to embark on an incredible journey, one that will take you through time and the centuries. The story of this journey is etched in stone on the north slope of the Wood Mountain Uplands, which stretch nearly 200 kilometers from east to west in southern Saskatchewan. Carved high on a beautiful clifftop setting are the renowned St. Victor petroglyphs, one of Canada's most puzzling prehistoric mysteries. Carved on the horizontal surface of this unique sandstone cliff are more than 300 images. When these images were carved, by whom, and for what reason are questions that remain a mystery to this very day. Preserving these carvings so that we may observe and study them in greater depth and detail will help us to better understand the ancient society of First Nations people who inhabited the great central plains of North America centuries ago. To gain an even greater understanding of the inhabitants of this land, we must visit the southlands of Saskatchewan, where they settled. The St. Victor petroglyphs are in many ways the geographical center of this area, but as you will soon discover, the country surrounding them is very diverse. It's also uniquely beautiful in its own special way. In fact, there's no place like it in all the earth.
it's easy to see why ancient societies settled in this beautiful place. The abundance of wildlife, water, and shelter made the Southlands an obvious and attractive choice. Because the years of time and erosion have worn away much of the sharpness and definition of these carvings, only a small number remain identifiable. The vast majority are now a puzzle. Among the most recognizable carvings are numerous images of creature and critter footprints, the plains grizzly being the most prominent. Several human images and symbols, hand and footprints, faces, Bodies and skulls are nestled carefully amongst a host of cloven hoof prints, turtles, and other animal images. Man and beast live together in close proximity and contact, often in conflict, but always with awe and deep respect for each other. And for Mother Earth from whence they came. As we study this site, the importance of certain carvings is glaringly apparent. The deeper the images were carved into the stone, the greater the importance and significance of the symbol. Bison and grizzly bear and a lone eagle track are the deepest carved and therefore the best preserved on this site. They were also, without controversy, the most significant of all creatures in the lives of these prehistoric dwellers of the past. The grizzly represented power and control, the bison, sustenance and survival. The eagle symbolized the soaring spirit of man and his deep spirituality. The St. Victor petroglyphs are indeed a magical, mystical and sacred place, both literally and figuratively. For cultures of old believed in the power of magic. It permeated and influenced every aspect of life. This special place of peace and tranquility offered a place of refuge, lodging and inspiration, both to those who visited and those who dwelt in this vast land. Even today, in the 21st century, that same peace and inspiration may be felt by all who visit this sacred place. The countryside surrounding the St. Victor petroglyphs has a quiet beauty and majesty all its own. The gigantic hills are cut and slashed with deep coulees and canyons filled with numerous trees and shrubs, flora and fauna, too numerous to mention. The St. Victor petroglyphs of the Great Southwest are also unique in another special way. It's the only horizontal site on the Great Canadian Plains. Most petroglyphs are carved on the vertical surface of rock and stone cliffs, not on the top, the horizontal surface. There are only four other horizontal sites in all of Canada. The best time for viewing or photographing images is early morning shortly after first light. Evening is equally as good. Long shadows are then cast allowing images hidden when the sun is high or clouds fill the sky to magically appear, as if out of nowhere. As stated before, many images have been worn away, not just by wind and erosion, but by thoughtless visitors walking carelessly over these delicate, ancient carvings. Too bad because preservation of these and all records of the past is not only important, but essential to our survival. It took a great deal of time and energy to carve these images, in stone nonetheless. Why would prehistoric dwellers of the past go to such great lengths to carve such images if these images and symbols were not important? Fact of the matter is, they were and are important to their way of life and ours as well.
For the images carved here are not the simple musings of a child, but powerful images by the most highly respected individuals from the past of an ancient way of life. These images are now all that remain of a culture and people that have disappeared from the face of the earth. They're the last vestiges to a way of life we know virtually nothing about. Surely they're worth preserving and protecting, along with all other artifacts and art from the past. Rock art, such as this, found here at St. Victor, is sparsely scattered throughout North America, from Mexico in the south to the Churchill River of northern Saskatchewan. Since this site is approximately one kilometer above sea level, and the view so spectacular, we're left with the question, was this a vision or quest site? Perhaps it was both. It is now, with the utmost respect, that we begin our journey into the past. What you're about to see is really a brief moment in time, a mere snapshot, so to speak, representing hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years of history and art. What a rare privilege to look not into the future, but into the past. Here we have the beautiful images of the Plains Grizzly Bear paws. Please follow the marker as it traces the outline of the foot pad. Note how the carver has created a perfect image of the foot pad as you would find it in the mud. Here we have the long claws of the Grizzly Bear. Note how they're nicely carved into the sandstone. The carver would have used a series of holes drilled into the sandstone and through the use of an arbor would have removed the excess material leaving behind a nice image of the powerful claws of the grizzly bear. The footpad of the second footprint is here. You see the marker is nicely pointing out the long claws of the second footprint back towards the heel and please note you can see how the claws of the first footprint extend into the heel pad of the second footprint. Here we have a collection of carvings on this stone. Note the many different pieces that are visible. This is a cloven hoof print here. As we look at the cloven hoof part of the print, one side and then the other side, and now the dew claws which are at the back, showing the direction which the animal would have been walking and the carver is suggesting that the animal is walking from that footprint to this one. And you can see it's not quite as clear an image. The third one coming up is a little better image of a cloven hoof print. Some have been worn off by people walking on here and just general erosion of the sandstone. This carving we come to is the most powerful image of the Plains Grizzly Bear found on this site. The carver has really spent his time carving a powerful image of a huge creature that roamed the plains by carving this heavy looking footprint with the massive curve in the paw. Note how deeply it is carved into the stone. Even the claws are deeply gouged in. They're very jagged and long protruding showing immense power and strength this bear would have had. Here we have the image of what could be a teepee or a sweat lodge. The line the marker is showing you is what we consider to be the ground line or the line that this object is sitting on. Side one and side two of the object. And in the center you can see a gouged out pocket quite deep compared to the rest of the design 
Just above it is a round circle carved in and, and from the circle you see a line protruding out across the sandstone block over towards an edge. At this point the line stops and then at the end of it is what appears to be like a rattle or a round object of some shape or description. There's a series of tiny little dots across the top end of it as if something may be coming out of it. The line goes back here it, almost like a fork or a long shaft that would have been held or positioned as holding a rattle. This image that we are coming to is very puzzling in that we're not sure what we're looking at. This would appear to be a head going down into the body and looks like legs protruding out to this point and down into this one would be the other leg. And there's a line coming up as if a hand or arm is holding something and here we have a line with a round object again. It is similar to the one we've just seen before. It also has a series of little holes at the top formed almost like a rattle and is creating sound. Is this a man running or jumping or is it a dancer who is holding a rattle and calling the animals? We're not quite sure. It is badly worn away and hard to see exactly what was here. Here's an example of the plane's bison footprint, the toes and the dew claws showing the direction the animal is walking in. You can see how wide the toes are spread apart as if the foot would have been into the mud as the pressure goes down the foot widens out. This carving is part of or is it part of the dancer? They're linked right together at the bottom. It is very difficult to know if it is one carving or it is actually two carvings. To the left of the screen you see an example of leprosy. The upper surface of the sandstone block is fracturing away from the layers beneath. It is slowly encroaching on the carving of man. The carving is a series of holes put together and arbored out, leaving the outline of the body, legs, head, with a deeper cut in the body. Right beside the man we find the remains of the plains grizzly bear paw. Here we come to the second image of man. The marker is pointing to his shoulder and then we move over to show you where his head is, back along the arm to the hand which is pointing upwards. The other arm is extended out with the palm facing up. You can see the faint line here, hand about there, which seemed to hold a circle. At one time it was visible, but due to the heavy traffic it was worn away. The marker will come back along to the hand, into the shoulder, and down the side of the body. We see the series of holes that have been pounded and chipped across the body, which leaves us the image of maybe the man was wearing a type of clothing. The series of holes seem to have been chipped and pounded out instead of being arbored or drilled out in the other fashions. We move down to the foot where multiple series of little dents and pockets can be seen. The second foot is slowly being chipped away by the leprosy as it eats at the surface of the sandstone. Just above the image of man we find a human footprint. The marker is following the outline of the foot to the toes. You see small impressions drilled into the stone leaving toe prints. Back along the side of the foot leaving a nice image of this human footprint. Here we have the third image of man. The marker is tracing the bottom line of what appears to be clothing. We go down towards the feet. They are actually pointing together. We follow the marker from the clothing material up along the side of the body to the shoulders. The hands seem to be reaching up above the body past the head to some form of a mythological creature. This mythological creature appears to have two heads. The first head we come to is here, just above the man's head. It appears to be looking down towards the man. And the marker will trace along the outline of the body 
which seems to appear like a banana in shape on this carving. Here is the second head of this mythological creature. Here we have a human footprint. Notice the nice pad, the toes, which have been drilled out of a series of holes. Next to the human footprint, we find a cloven hoof print with the dew claws, which show us the direction the animal is walking in. And note that the animal is walking in the opposite direction to that of the design of the human footprint next to the face. We move across to the most ominous carving of this site. Follow the marker as it traces the outline of the skull. We can see the grotesque looking mouth with the wide open and the cavities of the vacant teeth showing here. But at early morning the sunlight makes this look like actual teeth sitting in the skull. Here we show you the high ridge of the cheekbone carved in nicely along at the bridge underneath the eye, the deep sunken eye sockets, the very deep groove cut in for the nasal passages which shows very good characteristics of this being a skull. Further down below the jawline we actually see three vertebrae showing. A very common characteristic of other carvings of faces at this site. We move back up to the eye sockets which seem to have lines extending down as if the skull is crying. Just above the skull seems to be a series of lines and designs which lead us to a question. Is there a headdress here or is there multiple symbols that are very hard to distinguish in this area? But something is protruding from the upper part of the skull into the rock formation above the head. To this side we find a cloven hoof print, quite large and very distinct in its characteristics. It is also having the dew claw showing the direction of the animal which is pointing up and away from the side of the face. We have two large human footprints. You can see the long style footprint, the nice long pad, heel, and go over to this footprint and look at the claws. In this one we actually have toes. Do we have an artist who is trying to carve a symbol of man and bear together in the one footprint. The marker is outlining a very large cloven hoof print. There's only one dew claw on this carving. It gives us an idea of the direction the animal is walking, which is similar to the footprints we had just seen to the left. The first element in this collection of carvings we come to is the human hand. Note the beautiful design of the hand. See how the fingers are being carved out. Every detail of each finger, knuckle and joint has been beautifully carved, almost as if you'd feel the carver used his own hand as a sample. We come to a symbol which is quite questionable. It looks and may represent the union of man and beast, in this case between man and the plains grizzly bear. Marker moves towards the, the large plains grizzly bear paw. It is pointing out the long claws, outline of the large foot pad, deeply cut in heel with the human hand and the grizzly bear and the union symbol situated between them. The second hand at this site shows the fingers deeply carved into the stone as if the hand is grasping hold, hanging on for dear life, for survival on the open plains with the plains grizzly bear. Here we have a different style of a human hand. It is deeply cut and it's just an outline. It's not the whole hand cut in. Kind of a deep gouged, uh, pounded or chipped outline of a hand there's a kind of a groove cut into the palm area which may suggest the wrist bones and it is a totally different carving of a human hand from the other ones. We move to the left of the hand to find a small head carved into the sandstone. There's what appears to be two eyes 
maybe a nose or a mouth, long neck, and the outline of the head is similar to the hand, a wide, deeply pounded track, and there also appears to be feathers or some form of headdress just above the head. Here is a beautiful example of the Plains Grizzly Bear paw print, showing us the beautiful design and the power of this creature by the depth of the carving. Note the long claws, how they extend out far past the length of the pad, giving us a good picture of how powerful this creature was and how menacing it was to the people living here. Here we have a large carving of a cloven hoof print. It looks to be partially completed, leaving us a suggestion that maybe it's walking towards the cliff. Here we have two triangles. The baseline of the first one appears to be turning up into the center of the triangle. Go across the apex of the triangle to the top of the second one, and again the line appears to curve inwards towards the center of the triangle. Here we have a series of holes drilled along the edge of this boulder. Three of them are quite visible here, almost in a sequence as to size and shape and depth. What they're for we do not know. Uh, it's interesting to note that the lichen is growing within this one and it gives a nice character to the hole. Follow the marker as it points out the cloven hoof print. This cloven hoof print is nicely carved but with all the lichen that grows on this boulder it is very hard to see. Due to the limited amount of foot traffic on this carving, we have a beautifully preserved carving as to the way it was when the carver designed it. The marker points out the edge of a human footprint which goes over the edge of the rock, back along the other side, and pointing out the toes which are filled with a black moss. Here we have one of the nicest carvings of the human footprint. It is nice and deeply carved into the sandstone. It is a nice image of a complete foot. And it is nice and clear as to all the features of the foot, the heel, the instep, along the side of the inner edge of the foot. And you can see the toes are fairly clearly defined, one of them having lichen inside the toe. The marker is pointing out one of the many holes that are drilled around this carving. What they were for, we are not sure. Here is another example of the human footprint. The marker shows from the toe back along the instep, around past the heel, up to the other side. Note this foot has only got four toes and that the design is in a similar curvature of the Plains Grizzly Bear. Here we have a very large cloven hoof print situated between the two human footprints. The right side and the left side of the cloven hoof print and the dew claws are down over the edge of the rock, making it very hard to see the one here and the other one is there. Here we have a beautiful example of a bird track carved in the sandstone. Does it represent the eagle, prairie chicken, or another bird that was important to the native people? Here we have a cloven hoof print right beside the bird track. The second cloven hoof print, as the marker shows you, and the dew claws at the back of the footprint showing the direction of animals walking in. Follow the marker as it points out the toes of this footprint. Note kind of long and widespread out toes. The marker will now go down along the side of the foot, coming to the heel pad and around the heel and back up the instep of the foot. We are amazed at the accuracy of the carver's ability to carve these footprints here as they are an exact replica of the footprints we can find today of the elk of the Wood Mountain uplands. Here the marker is pointing out the head of the turtle. The marker will move down along the side of the head over to the left front flipper, coming back around the edge of the flipper towards the canopy, back along 
on the left side of the turtle, move down to the left rear flipper, and come back to the canopy, down to what appears to be a tail. And to have a tail on a turtle would possibly represent the male. We move over to the right side, showing the right rear flipper of the turtle, up the side to the right front flipper. The turtle is known in many of the legends as the carrier of earth on his back. Also, the turtle would be an important creature in that it would define fresh, drinkable water as it would be quite important on the plains where much of the water is heavily alkaline. Just behind the male turtle, we find another carving of a smaller turtle. The marker will point out what could be the head of this turtle. Note, this one is not a line drawing of a turtle. The whole shell area has been removed and cut into the stone. It could be a representation of a female turtle. Its smaller size would indicate that. Mother Nature has carved these unique and exciting cliffs of sandstone over thousands of years of time through the continual erosion of wind, rain, snow, and ice. From a distance, they appear to be rough and rugged. In actual fact, however, they are not. The truth is, these magnificent cliffs are very fragile and are disintegrating at an alarming rate. They are, in fact, crumbling as we speak, returning to the very sand from whence they came. This precious heritage site could be as much as eight or 9,000 years old. However, in the last 100 years alone, it has deteriorated more than in all the years of its previous existence. The reasons these cliffs and petroglyphs are vanishing are not complex, but they are disturbing, to say the least. What's even more disturbing is that we seem unwilling to hear the truth of the matter. We seem to care little for Mother Earth. If we truly cared, we'd pay attention to the obvious signs of distress and despair she proclaims. We'd treat her with the respect she deserves. Here at St. Victor, increased foot traffic over the delicate carvings has erased many precious images, never to be seen again. Acid rain is eating away at the delicate surface of sandstone cliffs, making them even more delicate and more vulnerable to the harsh realities of wind, weather, and extreme temperature conditions, often 50 degrees below freezing in winter and scorching 40 degree heat in the summer. In short, the hard exterior of sandstone is being destroyed, exposing the softer material below. As the hard exterior flakes away and is blown to the four corners of the earth, so are the precious carvings. As prehistoric dwellers of this land made their mark on this site, so modern man has made his mark. Modern-day carvers became over-enthusiastic excavators, tunneling deeply into the base of these delicate cliffs, weakening their walls, causing the heaviest outcroppings of sandstone and carvings to come crashing down. Not only have we lost numerous valuable carvings because of some mindless, senseless behavior, but now the very walls that hold back thousands of tons of sandstone and carvings are falling away, tumbling into the valley below. How fortunate were the excavators of these tunnels to have escaped with their very lives. For as the megatons of sandstone boulders came thundering down, the young four to six inch ash trees in their path below were snapped off like twigs and splintered like toothpicks. Furthermore, because of this tunneling activity, two more huge outcroppings, each containing many more valuable carvings, are hanging precariously above the rubble, ready to topple at any moment. In short, 100 years of pollution and acid rain, 
decades of careless foot traffic on the carvings and recent mindless excavations have accelerated the deterioration and imminent destruction of one of the most picturesque prairie landscapes and world-class heritage sites. It is with sadness and regret that we mourn the loss of such a precious sight. Unless we act now to gather men, women, and resources to preserve and protect the St. Victor petroglyphs, they will soon tumble into the valley of oblivion, taking with them every secret and every mystery from the past. As these petroglyphs disappear, so will a tiny window into the past through which we observe the lives and culture of those who have walked before us in this magnificent place. When you look at the numbers of sites, say in Montana, North Dakota, and Saskatchewan, compared to the numbers of people who have lived here over the last, say, couple of thousand years, there's a very small number of sites. So I would suggest that they were, uh, these sites are really quite special places. And I just have a feeling that at St. Victor in particular, the grizzly bear tracks would not be done by just the ordinary person. I, I have a feeling that they're done by people who um, had a connection spiritually uh, to, to the, the grizzly bear and this would be one of the most powerful figures in the, um, in the supernatural world of the, uh, of the people. Remember that uh, these have been here for a long time so just by definition there would be people coming along uh, to the site probably long after it had first been made, right? The carvings had been made. So the new uh, uh, generations of people using the site uh, might be um, coming there be, uh, to, to receive uh, guidance or receive information, receive uh, maybe power. Uh, uh, but the original creators, right, of the art, maybe we're doing it for a different, different reason. Uh, I, I really do feel that though it, it would have been regard, regarded as a very special place. And also there's some evidence of superimposition of some of the carvings. So this shows that people are coming along, uh, even if most of them were made at one point. Um, there were definitely several occasions when people came and, and actually carved uh, near, you know, sometimes overlapping some of the figures. So. It's, it was being revisited, at least by some people. But I, I think it's, we can speculate uh, very comfortably on the idea that uh, um, this would have been a very well-known and very special sacred place. The, um, the carvings are made in, in one spot, not all over the whole area. Uh, there's a concentration there. And um, I think people just would have known about it. it. It would have been talked about for generations. You know, the people knew their environment very intimately. They knew where every uh, significant, special place was, unusual rocks or um, old settlements, and that sort of thing. And this is of that nature, you know, a very, a very notable spot. There is a tremendous view from there, and it is one of the largest outcrops in the area, that's, that's certain. Um, and um, it's just a nice uh, canvas for, uh, for our artists to, to have worked on. Um, it's, uh, it, well, I think we today can feel it as a special spot. So um, it's, it just seems right that there would be a lot of carvings there. You yourself feel it's a special spot because you've studied fairly extensively that area, but mm -hmm. what makes it special for you? What, what brings you back time and time again? It's a sort of a combination of the topography and the, uh, the far sight lines and um, 
the uh, the coolies, uh, you know, I know from a biological point of view, it's just a very rich area for uh, both plants and animals. And of course, it would have been attractive for uh, the Aboriginal people uh, for uh, both food and medicinal plants alone. And um, uh, when we look at other uh, archaeological phenomena in Saskatchewan, like uh, boulder effigies and medicine wheels, we find too that they're on elevated places. In fact, many burials are on elevated places. So this um, uh, is a natural feature that that uh, is sort of um, ready-made for uh, and inviting people to maybe make special marks and. Uh, enhance that, that specialness. Just the uh, topographical and geographical uh, circumstances of uh, where the carvings are found um, are very much in tune with um, the idea of regarding high places uh, as special places, you know, for um, creating um, either art in this case or um, monuments like medicine wheels. Uh, from uh, a modern point of view of significance, the uh, site is unique in Saskatchewan. Uh, it's, um, well, it's unique in Canada. And I really feel that we do not understand the significance or we don't appreciate the significance of that uniqueness literally we've walked all over it. It's like taking the Mona Lisa and taking her off the wall, putting it on the floor and walking all over it. And if we continue to um, neglect the site like that, um, we would have the same damage that we would have uh, if we did that to the Mona Lisa for too long. But you know the collapse that happened in uh, 2001 of the part of the cliff is uh, uh, I attribute to um, human neglect, uh, not just a natural um, erosion. It was a natural erosion process, but uh, there were warnings given about that, and uh, basically nothing was done. And uh, what we really need, if we're going to respect this site and treat it with the significance that it deserves, is to uh, take some active measures to, uh, I don't mean intrusive measures, but active measures to try to halt um, loss of more of the carvings through neglect. Where do the St. Victor Petroglyphs fit into the Canadian scene in terms of significance? Well, for uh, the whole Plains area, of course, we've got the very spectacular series of um, rock carvings and, and a few painting sites along the Milk River in Alberta. It is a World Heritage Site uh, for good reason. Um, aside from that, on the Canadian Plains, this is the major site. And the whole Northern Plains region of, of both the United States and Canada. So right in that sense, it, uh, it, it's unique, it's large, you know, in, in relative numbers. For that reason alone, we don't have to go any further. Um, how we designate uh, provincial uh, historic sites and national sites of national significance, uh, this one is of national significance. It could well have national historic site status. It's a matter of priority. You know, you mentioned the Suvian peoples. What other First Nations peoples would you say inhabited that site? Uh, Plains Cree, uh, Assiniboine, Soto, uh, Gros Ventre, Blackfoot people could have uh, been involved in, uh, in uh, this uh, site. There's no, no uh, uh, proof that any particular one group was involved in this, uh, in this case. And the cultures of, of uh, the historic period on the Northern Plains, even though there was warfare at times, they were very uh, much sharing each other's ceremonies, beliefs, practices. Um, 
you know, it was not just uh, tribal boundaries and that was it. So that just adds to our uh, uh, the, the um, problems in understanding. It adds to what we would call the mystery, I guess, uh, which isn't very satisfying in, in many ways, but um, that's the fact of the matter. Maybe with more research, maybe with more excavation near, at sites nearby, we'll get a little bit better handle on um, some of the tribal uh, connections and, and certainly time connections.